Hello, How's the sound, everyone? by the way? I've got two choices of micro microphone. Um, I think that one's right. Okay, cool. <laughs> so welcome everyone to today's session of A Shape Your Future. As we gather for this meeting from different places around Australia, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from which we meet. Today, I'm joining you from Gadigal land, and I pay respect to our elders past, present, and any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us online today. As we share and discuss our own knowledge and practices, we acknowledge the deep knowledge forever embedded in country. And today is our last Shape Your Future session for term two, but there are plenty more coming. And if you visit the Stella website, which the link is on the top of the screen, you can see uh, the first few that are for next term that we're getting up and then and the others will come in after. But the Shape Your Future series is made possible by the Victorian Challenge and Enrichment series, and we are broadcasting to schools across the country. But today we are joined by Dr. Dana McKay, who's going to talk to us about her STEM career journey and how she's come to do what she's doing today. So thank you, Dana. Thanks, Camille. Hi, everyone. I hope you're all having a good morning, evening, afternoon, whatever it might be where you are. Um, I'm just going to share my slides. So you've probably heard lots of journeys where basically everything went really well. Well, pretty much every good career decision I've made, I made by accident. So I'm going to tell you the story of making lots of good mistakes and how you can build a career out of doing that. Um, thanks, Camille, for your acknowledgement of country. Uh, I would just like to acknowledge the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands RMIT conducts the majority of their business. Um, research, teaching and learning has happened in Australia for millennia, and I think it's important to acknowledge that. Also, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm a New Zealander. So I'd like to acknowledge the Taranaki and Tiatiawa people on whose stolen country I grew up as well. Um, a lot of that land has now been given back, but it's still important to acknowledge that the way that that, that happened was not the right way for things to, to go. So what I do now, I do research on how people find, manage, use, abuse information. I teach. Uh, mostly about human computer interaction, which is the study of how people use computers and how computers can be made easier to use. And I promote the cause of women in technology. And this is me promoting that cause with my very own little woman in technology who is six at the moment. My research is on, I've got three primary projects at the moment. Uh, I study browsing and how to make online browsing better. So for your next ebook or your next Netflix video or your next Hello Cat. I've just had a cat arrive in the room. I apologize if she keeps talking. Or for the next piece of new piece of music you find, I'm trying to make that process better and easier. I study how people find information that influences the way that they think. So whether that's information, misinformation, um, how they use online information in the process of view change. And I'm also studying how technology is being used in abusive, in the patterns of abusive relationships from the perspective of the people who are doing the abusing in the hope that we can design technology a bit better and make it safer so that it's harder for people to be abusers. And less appealing too, because I think, to be honest, as technologists, we've made it all a bit easy and appealing to be abusive. So from the outside, I look successful. I've got the PhD. I've won a bunch of best paper awards. I'm a senior lecturer three years out of my PhD. I won a scholarship to Science Meets Parliament. I'm being promoted by the universities I'm associated with on International Women's Day. I was one of three people in Australia who got a Google PhD fellowship in 2016, incidentally, also the year my daughter was born. You know, it all looks grand. It all looks like it all just came easily to me and I knew exactly what I was doing. From the inside, it's like, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, keep it going, keep it going. 
Um, I do work with very cool people and I love my job, but it certainly hasn't been always easy and it hasn't always come easy to me either. So even when you see someone that you think is doing amazing things and you think, oh gosh, I'd so like to be like them. Well, probably you are, but probably they're just as frantic on the inside as you are. So how did I get here? Well, I think the first step was when I was about six years old. I heard my mother use the word research in conversation. I can't remember now what she was using it about. But I said, oh, what's research? And she said, oh, studying something really closely so that you learn new things. And I thought, wow, that sounds cool. So for the next three lunch times at school, I spent all of lunchtime poking a little crevice in a rock with a stick doing research to see what was inside the rock. Um, I wasn't six when this picture was taken, but that rock is still there. And the last time I was home in New Zealand, I made a point of going and having a picture taken with my research rock. So there you go. I can't believe the rock is still there, to be honest, because it's probably far too dangerous for most school playgrounds. So I first heard the word research when I was six and I thought it sounded pretty cool, but I had no idea that it was something that you could do as a job. This photo is taken in a small country school in a town that basically serves the area's dairy farmers. I grew up on a dairy farm. I was an awfully long way from where I am now. When I was about nine, we moved into town where town was 50,000 people. And to be clear, that's about half the number of students that RMIT currently has. So the whole town I grew up in was half the number of people that RMIT has as students. But I had this amazing teacher who was desperately keen to get computers into the classroom. So I started playing around with an Apple IIe, doing a bunch of things with databases, playing where in the world is Carmen San Diego. I also, in 1988, sent what must have been one of the first emails from a New Zealand classroom. Um, we had a modem in the classroom and it didn't even sound like that horrible squealy thing that you used to get when you connected to the internet. And it was like a dollar a character or more, but it was during the Seoul Olympics. And this teacher who was really into computers was like, hey, we can send a message to the athletes using the computer and hooking it up to a phone line. So as a class, we very carefully composed this message to Mark Todd, who you see in this photo, who won gold at those Olympics riding charisma. And I remember what I contributed to this, this email was New Zealand is with you all the way. He actually wrote back, which I'm sure no sp sports person would ever do now, but it was so new and so rare that, you know, this was a big deal for the sports people as well. So by the time I was about 11 years old and going to middle school, because we have middle school in New Zealand, I was thinking about, you know, what do I want to do? And I was, I loved computers. I thought computers were really cool. And it never occurred to me that they weren't a thing for girls because nobody had bothered to tell me that. And the teacher who had introduced them, me to them was female. So why would it ever occur to me that they weren't for me? So I was thinking, well, it might be kind of fun to be a computer engineer, which is what we called it back then. But I, I also loved constructing an argument. And I was like, well, maybe I want to be a lawyer instead. And then I ran into long division and it just didn't make sense. I just, I, I couldn't figure it out. And for the first time in my entire educational career, I felt really, really stupid. And I thought, and I'd been told, oh, you know, to be a computer engineer, you have to be good at math. And I thought, oh, well, I guess I'm destined to be a lawyer then constructing arguments for the rest of my life. A couple of years later, I got to high school and I was lucky enough to meet these two people who now run a very well-known cafe in my tiny little province of 100,000 people. These people were my English teachers in high school. The one on the left is the one I had when I was 13. The one on the right I had later on in my high school career. These people taught me to write. I could already construct an argument, but my gosh, they taught me how to put it off across properly using the written word. And Stuart Greenhill, the, the bloke on the left, they were, they were actually a couple. If we were kind of faffing around in class or pretending 
not to know something or if we were being a bit slow, he'd look at us and he'd say, you know, you know this. And it's something I've carried with me through the rest of my life. If I'm, if I'm faffing or being a bit uncertain, I'll think, come on, you know, you know this. Having said that, it was Joe Stallard, his wife on the left, who really, really built confidence in me. She was the one that taught me, actually, yeah, I can do this, even if it's hard. Don't run away, even if it's hard. These teachers, and I have been back to see them and thank them for this, really changed my life. Because by the time I got to university, I was the only person in my class who could string a sentence together, let alone a convincing argument. When I was about 16, I decided it was time to get the heck out of New Zealand. I just, I needed a break. I needed to do something different. And it happened that my, ho my stepdad was a member of Rotary Club and they did student exchanges. Well, I was thinking about where to go and I'd been to Canada quite a few times because my mum was Canadian. And I just, I wanted to go to Europe. I wanted to learn another language. And I was offered a choice of two countries. I was told I could go to Finland or I could go to Sweden. And I was like, well, I've heard Finnish is really difficult to learn. So maybe I'll go to Sweden. And then the Rotary guy phones me back and he's like, look, we have this great program with Finland. We'd really like to send someone this year. And I was like, look, anywhere but here. So I went and spent a year living in Finland and it was life changing. I ended up living with designers. The person on the bottom right of the slide is Helena Huvenen, who if you look her up after this talk, was the Dean of the School of Design at Aalto University, one of the most famous design universities in the world um, for a number of years. And she was an invited Dean. The top two, uh, the pictures at top left are me walking on the sea, because you know, that's a thing you can do in Finland and hanging out with my host brother who was also an amazing designer until he unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. These people being somewhere where I had to learn a new language, so I was so down and forced to really think about what I said, where being a bit different, because I was a bit different growing up in a dairy country town, was, was not perceived necessarily as a bad thing, where being intellectually curious was not perceived as a bad thing. This was life-changing, and, you know, I meant to go to Sweden. Oh, well, that was a great mistake. So I got back from my trip to Finland and I had been, honestly, I had been planning to do a university degree in some kind of humanities, possibly English, possibly something along those lines. And uh, look, I, uh, I decided that I needed something that could take me back to Finland because I still had my final year at high school to do after my exchange. And the whole goal was to get back to Finland. So I decided that I would go back to my 11 year old plan of doing computer engineering. I thought that sounded definitely cool. And then I showed up at university and went, oh, hang on, this, this, this computer engineering thing means actual soldering of, of chips and stuff. That is absolutely not for me. So I started to look around to what I could change my course to. And it was one of a family of, of degrees and one of the other degrees in the program was artificial intelligence. And I looked at that one and went, wow, that looks really, really cool because you get to do all this philosophy and psychology and linguistics. And I thought, that's definitely the way to go. So I became a computer scientist who was also a thinker. It wasn't that I was particularly interested in AI and possibly uniquely in computing. I'm still not particularly interested in AI, except in terms of the ethics of the way it affects us as human beings. But it meant that I got to do all the really cool optional subjects. So I did. I did lots of philosophy. I did lots of linguistics. I did some education classes. I did some psychology. I even won a prize for philosophy in my second year of my degree. And I loved it. I loved mixing that world of technology and that world of humanities. But I didn't know that that was something that you could do as a job by this stage. However, the seed had been planted. In my first year in computer science, we had this amazing lecturer, a guy called Tony Smith, 
who in the last lecture of the of the the first semester said you know the great thing about computing the wonderful thing about computing is that it's an umbrella you can study whatever you like and computers are a way to study it so he started to give this example about ah uh, if um you discovered a piece of piece of literature written in 1602 and you weren't sure whether uh christopher marlowe or william shakespeare had written it sorry sir if it was written in 1602 it was definitely shakespeare because marlowe had been killed in a bar fight by then you get the picture but he was saying you know computers can analyze the text and help us determine who might have been likely to write it he also started talking about the intersection between computers and linguistics, pointing out the sentence that actually comes from Noam Chomsky, but I thought it was his brilliant thing of the colorless green dream sleeps furiously. And it really caught my imagination, but I couldn't quite figure out why it was so important to me. And I thought, well, you know, I've had fun doing some programming. It was pretty awesome getting the computers to do stuff that I wanted them to do rather than just what they'd been programmed to do by someone else. I'd written a game of Connect Four. I think I'll continue with this computer science thing. And I really, really enjoyed it. Not only that, I was good at it. Everyone was astonished to find out that I'd never done any programming before I got to university when I admitted to it on enrolling in my second semester classes. So, you know, it was just a nice fit, but you know, there was that part of me that still wanted to write essays and think big thoughts and dream about the colorless green dream that was sleeping furiously. So I kind of trucked along doing computer science, learning how to program. I even got to write a, the, the basic components of an operating system in my second year. Also got to write a theorem prover in my second year, which is pretty unusual, but you know, it was a lot of fun. These were great intellectual exercises, but you know, I thought, um, I guess I'm just going to become a programmer. And then in my fourth year, I needed to design a program of study that had some classes in semester one and some classes in semester two, because I was starting a research project. And I was really annoyed by this. I wanted to do all the really nerdy, hardcore computer science classes that were only available in semester two. And I was for once told no. Normally I got my own way, but this time I was told no. I was told I had to do something in semester one. And so I went through what was available in semester one and went, oh, okay, human computer interaction, that looks okay, I guess, if I have to take something. And the lecturer actually went around the class at the beginning of the, the semester and said, why is everyone here? And I said, I'm here because I have to take something that's an A semester and your class looked like the best of a bad lot. Tact has never been my strong point, it has to be said. Um, by the end of the semester, I was completely hooked. It was the thing that made everything that I'd been learning make sense. It was the thing that allowed me to bring my humanities head and my computer science head together to do something that actually made the world a better place, not worse to do something that brought analysis and people together. By the following year, I was tutoring the class and I had completely changed my program of study to do a master's that was focused on human computer interaction. But I really, you know, I was really resistant to having signed up to that class. Another great mistake. So I mentioned that when I was six, I heard the word research and thought, oh, that sounds cool. Well, in my fourth year of my degree, I got to do a research project and wow, that was that was cool. That was so much fun. You know, I got to get my teeth into a project. I constructed my own project. Um, I chose a female computer scientist I wanted to work with. That's Sally Jo Cunningham, who's listed on the slide. I just, I loved being able to design my own project. And I was like, wow, you know, this research thing, I wasn't wrong when I was six. It really was cool. I also started getting to collaborate with wonderful people like our thinker on the left, who's still one of my closest collaborators today. Cat, no, sorry, Cat trying to invade the talk. So I finished my master's degree and all of a sudden, I got sick. 
I'd been ready to go out and grab the world with both hands and find some cool stuff to do. And all of a sudden I was so sick, I couldn't stand up for more than 10 minutes at a time. I'd lost about 20 kilos. I honestly thought I must be dying because nobody gets that sick without dying. Turns out I was wrong. There's all these autoimmune conditions that will make you that sick, but not actually kill you. So I lost all my confidence and I kind of went, well, what am I going to do now? Around the same time, a new academic had started where I was working and he talked me into staying on as a research assistant. He organized an exchange to Nokia, which was in Helsinki. So I got to go back to Finland and hang out with my cool Finnish people for a while. And he talked me into starting a PhD. Two of these things were a good idea, but the PhD really wasn't. He wasn't as interested in supervising me as he'd made out to be. And I really wasn't ready to do the PhD. I'd just come out of a year of being really, really ill. I had surgery very shortly after I started my, my PhD and the university didn't have good support for it. Now, look, if you're thinking about doing a university career these days, universities are much better at dealing with this stuff these days. So please don't worry about that. I deal with at least three extension requests a week from students who have things going on. And the answer is always, that's fine. Please take care of yourself. So don't worry that if you're sick or if you're wor working with a disability or you know having some kind of struggle like that, that you're gonna be in trouble um, at university now. So about five years later, once I had my head back on and was running out of funding for this PhD, I decided I'd take a one-year job in Australia to earn some money before I came back to New Zealand and finished my PhD. Yeah, 10 years later, I was still there. And it was a cool job because I got to do some research. I got to go to conferences. I started working with my fun collaborator again. I won a couple of best paper awards. Got to go to Berlin. And then I got pregnant. And when I came back from my maternity leave, the whole department had been restructured. My job wasn't that much fun anymore. I couldn't see where it was going. And I'd started to think about going to Finland again. So I decided I needed to enroll in another PhD, one that I might actually finish this time. Now, I talked to the guy on the left at a conference and, I, you know, he was he was very senior in human computer interaction at the University of Melbourne, wanted to be at the University of Melbourne because I was interested after 10 years working in a library in information problems. Although, you know, I was in the library because I'd been interested in information problems before that. And I thought, you know, this guy, he's pretty senior. He's probably a good person to work with. He introduced me to the guy on the right, Shanton Chang. Now, after introducing me to Shanton, he's like, yeah, I have no further interest in this, Shanton, it's all yours. I was like, whoa, that's kind of rude. And, and maybe he doesn't think I'm very good. I was never so lucky as that day. What I came to learn is that, as you can probably tell from their pictures, the guy on the left is a bit straight laced and likes to tell his PhD students exactly what to do. The guy on the right treated me like a grown up and kind of let me go my own way and do my own thing. He's still one of my closest collaborators and a very dear friend. And he's a lot of fun to work with, as you can probably guess from the photo. Towards the end of the PhD, I was arguing with Shanton about whether the PhD needed a conclusion section or just a discussion section. And he was like, well, if you're gonna have a, a conclusion section, it needs to say something different that you can't just say as a reflection on all the research that's been written before. And I was like, okay, so it's time to finally admit what's been driving me on. And that's that the way we do things is just wrong. It's not ethical. We need to be supporting people to find information on their own better. And search engines don't really do that. So I finally admitted that actually it wasn't just about building a cool new browsing toy. It came from a deeply held ethical belief about people having the right to find information for themselves. It worked. My examiner or one of them said that my thesis was one of the best she'd ever examined. And she was a very senior person in human computer interaction. So that was really lovely. I managed to get a teaching post during my PhD. And at the end of my teaching post, I managed to transition it into a teaching and research post, which for those 
outside academia, that's the kind of the, the winning post. That's what you want. You want a teaching research post. But it wasn't a permanent post. It was a fixed term post because it was one of those ones that had been designed for women only. So I got my PhD in July 2019 and in March 2020, right at the beginning of my first academic year, pandemic. I missed out on going to a conference that pre to present a paper that really, really mattered to me. I was in a precarious job in a precarious industry. I was living under really strict lockdown conditions. My son got sent home from school. It was pretty much the worst start to an academic career you could imagine. And I spent a lot of time scared that I wouldn't have a job. I applied for some jobs at Melbourne, but I was passed over predominantly, I believe, for political reasons. And then I found a job at RMIT. So about a year ago now, I started at RMIT as a senior lecturer, dream run. Nobody gets a senior lecturer post three years out of a PhD. When I applied for that job, I was already under consideration for a job at Melbourne. I thought, oh, this is, this is you know, this is maybe the, the, the thing. I, and I want a senior lecturer. I'll never get it. Well, I didn't get the job at Melbourne, but I did get the job at RMIT and I love my job at RMIT and I'm working in a data science department that's half women. So if you're considering a career or a university degree in tech, one of the pieces of advice I would give you is look for somewhere that has lots of women and look for somewhere where the number of women are going up. It's more likely to be friendly to you if you're a woman or if you're dealing with any other kinds of diversity. So, this, is, this, this talk is a bit of a story of two parts. I'm sure from the outside, people think that I've had the super straight path that just rolls off into the sunset. But actually, it's, it's not like that at all. I've had the most amazing serendipitous experiences where I've met someone at a conference and we've ended up working together to do life-changing research. I've had precarious jobs. I've dealt with sexism but I've also had amazing opportunities because of my sex. I was interviewed by Vogue last week for their Women Who Code section. Um, I've met the most amazing women and people facing other diversities who are now part of my, my, my cr crew. I've had the most amazing achievements. I've done a lot of travel and I've got to see a lot of cool stuff. So, you know, you can avoid all of those kinks in the road but you don't necessarily want to because some of the mistakes you make shape your life for the better. Don't ever consider anything a mistake, just a bend in the road. And I will leave you as a, as a teenager of the nineties with the words of one of my, my heroes from that day, which is what it all comes down to is that I haven't got it figured out just yet, but everything's going to be fine. So that's the end of my talk. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Yes, so there is a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. If you have any questions for Dana, please put them in there. I'm sure there's lots <laughs> to, to ask. And, and it's been um, really great sitting and listening to your journey, um, Dana. So I hope that um, you, yeah, the people have taken away that the kinks and the mistakes are a problem. I I think you switched the camera to the other one. I've, I've switched. I've screwed up my camera. How many degrees in computer science does it take <laughs> to drive a Zoom meeting? More than I have. Apparently. <laughs> it's it's always spectacular, isn't it? And particularly when you have different setups, um, you don't, never know where anything is anymore. Uh, I, I wanted to to travel a little bit back to your kind of school career and things and and say, you know, when, when you were at high school and doing the, you know, research in the library and, and learning what it was, was there something else you wanted to be before the kind of computers came in and the lawyers came in? <laughs> was there something you dreamed of being? I mean, I, I grew up in a country town for a while. I wanted to be a vet because, um, you know, animals, helping animals seemed like a cool thing to do. <laughs> um, 
one of my primary school teachers from when I was about seven ran into my mum a few years ago while I was still working in the library and she heard I was working in the library and she's like oh it's so not a surprise that she ended up <laughs> in a library because I always had my head in a book and I loved books um so you know that's been a big part of my journey as well um yeah. You know, in my very, very early days, it was around the time I was 11, I was kind of looking at the computer versus lawyer thing. And as a researcher who works in human computer interaction, I've probably come as close as it's possible to come with, with kind of putting those two careers into a bowl, stirring them up and pouring them out and making the job I have. And I suppose the job you have now probably didn't really even exist back then at all it wasn't even thought of no the earliest sort of well early early academic human computer action did exist around then but it was it was absolutely in its infancy um and certainly not information focused you know the earliest mm. online library catalogs which is where all our search and that kind of um interaction started from were first rolled out in the late 80s, very early 90s. So yeah, the job that I do now did not meaningfully exist when I was six or seven years old. <laughs> Which is is definitely, you know, what we're seeing with computers now is the jobs that will exist. I can't even imagine what, what well, would be happening there. I was just speaking to Vogue last week about emerging careers and in technology and you know, we all know about the AI jobs, you know, programming the cool AIs, designing AIs to do cool stuff. But I was talking to them, and just in case some of your listeners are interested, I was talking to them about things like digital ethics roles, where we actually stop and think about what computers should do rather than just what they can do. Um, environmental auditing roles. So one of the things about a lot of this AI is that it, it uses huge amounts of energy to to generate these models. And so determining when it's good to build a new learning model and figuring how much energy it might cost to do that. And therefore, you know, greening that whole process so that it's not so tough on the environment. Um, mm. There are new roles emerging all the time. So I, I go back to, to Tony Smith's umbrella metaphor if there's something else that people are interested in alongside technology that's definitely something that they should keep back of their mind as they're doing their degree and and see if you can fit some other courses or subjects alongside your computing thing because you never know when that might turn into an opportunity yeah for sure <laughs> Definitely. Um, I was a little bit interested in when you were saying what you, you talk about, uh, like the libraries and things, but also how you're using um, abusers to, to look at the, the algorithms and things and how to stop abuse. Why have you come at it from that side as opposed to working with those who are victims? So victim survivors have been well, well studied. Um, there's been lots of work looking at the, the issue from a perspective of victim survivors. Um, the reason I was interested in abusers in particular is because to really know how to, you can design for interactions, so to make it easier to do something. And one of the classic examples of this is the ATM. You know how when you put your card in the ATM, it makes you take your card first? That's mm. to stop you from getting your card. It <laughs> used to be the other way around and they changed it to stop you from getting your card because essentially once you've got the money, your brain goes job done, nothing yeah. else to see here. So they need to make taking the money out of the machine the last thing you do. So that's designing for remembering the card. Now, if you were the type of person who wanted to design a machine where it was easy to steal someone's card, you'd do it the other way around, right? So you can design against certain kinds of interactions as well. Um, so I'm really keen to design against abusive interactions with technology. And I also have this hunch, and it certainly has been borne out by the research I've done on this project, which I've been doing with, let me be quite clear, I didn't just go off on a technology thing and start studying domestic abuse because that would be completely unethical. I've been working with scholars in that space, health scholars and legal scholars and all of those kinds of people. Um, and the early stuff does show that the information that these tools give us, because that's my angle on it, of course, is that these tools give us so much more information 
And the Apple AirTag is a classic example of this, of how easy it is to track mm. someone. But I suspect that that information feels a bit addictive or a bit compelling to the abusers. And that's why I wanted to study it, because I thought, well, you know, we can design things to be more or less addictive and compelling. We should find out what's really going on here, how they're actually using the technology, what it actually feels like to help support them to not use the technology in that way. Yeah, and so that's obviously taking a lot of collaboration between different sectors, as you say. So is it quite important in your work that using people who are doing completely, well, not completely, but slightly adjacent areas of work and research and and that. so I mean some of it's splitting hairs right I feel <laughs> like I'm not that techy um the last time I personally wrote a line of code was about five years ago no I tell a lie I was helping my son learn how to code so I have done some <laughs> this year but you know it's 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 a while since I've written code to do anything meaningful and I work with some people who are super, super, super techy, and we're working on some very cool projects together. So that to me feels like cross-disciplinary collaboration. I also work with proper information scientists. Um, and one of my PhD student comes from a feminist studies background. So wow. um, I'm working with, and then I've got this team of amazing women who are working on the abuse project. I've got a digital ethicist. I've got a health study, I've got a couple of health studies scholars, one of whom was a nurse before she went back to do her PhD. I've got a criminologist. Um, a lot of the impact of my work is going to be policy-based. So I'm looking to work with government, but I'm also looking to empower individuals. So I'm trying to work with the media too. And of course, working with the tech companies so that they don't roll something out like the Apple AirTag again and then go, whoops. <laughs> We're helping people stop people. <laughs> so um, we've also spoken about empowering women and and uh, you say, you, you know, you've got a lot of women who are working in your team. And, and other than that, what are other ways that you're helping, um, you know, empower other women in STEM? Because it is... It is a, a thing, particularly in your in the as you say in the tech sector, where there's predominantly it, it's been male for a very long time. Uh, what kind of things are you doing to help encourage women to to do STEM and maybe tech specific? So one of the things I'm doing is advocating for the types of um, content I teach. Yes, there are some women who love to do super super technical things, and that's not. That's not inherently gendered. It's not that we have different brains, but socially women tend to be and this is a broad tendency more interested in the kind of computers plus something else that's there have been lots of studies boys are super interested and I say boys because I mean young boys boys are super interested in computers as a thing and girls because of the kinds of things we're taught about ourselves as very young children tend to be interested in computers plus something else and so the subjects I, or courses I teach are the computers plus people, right? So this is, and it can be a way into computing as well um, for people who never considered themselves technical. They do this class on how to design computer stuff better. And they think, well, that's actually cool. And maybe I could do something like that. Um, I also have a research strand looking at um, women's representation in computing because one of the things that we know is that if you don't count it, it doesn't count. And so I'm actually counting up the numbers of women who are publishing in a, a variety of areas and looking at more versus less prestigious publications, essentially in the long term to hold these organizations to account to actually make it a better space. Um, I also am choosing to work somewhere that supports women and tell people how to find places that support women. So again, look for the number of women going up, not going down. If the number of women is going down, um, run, don't walk. <laughs> um, because we know that role models are super important. You know, we had Grace Hopper down under um, in Australia a couple of years ago. I ran a workshop there about how to position yourself with a multiplicity of identities. So essentially all of these opportunities that I have um, to reach out to women, I 
have been in the media talking about how we need to read stories about brilliant women to little boys as well as little girls so that there's room for brilliant little girls in these STEM spaces. So it's it's not any one thing, but it's a lot of small things. Um, my current hobby horse is getting the name boot camp on one of the courses where I am changed to immersive because I feel like boot camp is quite exclusionary, not just to women, but also to people who have come from highly militarized environments and maybe don't like that military terminology as well. Yeah, every little thing builds up to a, a bigger thing, doesn't it? And the more yeah. we do, um, it, the more it is. So I think that's that's a very important message, particularly for, for both genders, I think not just for girls, but also for boys to be mindful of, of what they're saying and doing. Uh, and I guess you, you've put up a few examples of people who you didn't didn't work well with or it just didn't turn out with that have you um come across them again subsequently <laughs> I guess in, in your twisty path and say oh I've kind of come back to that person and gone okay yeah it wasn't it wasn't right at the time but I can still see as you say see that it's a good thing <laughs> so my closest collaborator and I didn't speak for seven years so yes <laughs> it is possible <laughs> to come back to people um after I left from my first PhD, there was a time where I wasn't really doing any research, but when I started up again, I started working with the people I'd been working with again. So um, some people you lose touch with and it just is that way, but some people you come back to and it's kind of great. Um, one of my other collaborators, I met at a conference in 2011 and we met a few times over the years. We, you know, come across each other at conferences or while I was traveling there. And then finally, we got to do a project together in 2019. Thank goodness we did, because, you know, if I'd waited a year, it wouldn't have happened. <laughs> um, and now we meet a, a couple of times a month to talk through what we're doing and, and what we're going to do next to try and make the world a better place. So that's a really mm. fun collaboration. <laughs> Thank yeah it's a good idea you're allowed to close doors to people who are awful to you but if you don't have to close a door you know if it's just been something that hasn't worked out quite that well try not to close the door because you never know where it might end up if you walk back through it yeah for sure and I guess my my last question I like to uh, sit on a bit like if you weren't at RMIT obviously you love me <laughs> being at RMIT if you weren't there where else in the world would you like to work is there somewhere doing great work you'd like to be I mean Alto because you know Helsinki <laughs> I still, <laughs> still keep thinking about moving back there and, and you know I have two cats and two kids and one of the cats is ancient and nobody <laughs> except me in the household speaks Finnish and <laughs> No, I keep talking about it, but I don't know that it would ever happen. Um, University of British Columbia in Vancouver does amazing information science work. Really great people would be a lovely place to work um, if someone was going to, you know, endow me with a couple of million dollars to buy housing. So this is this is one of the things that you, you kind of have to trade off, right? It's not yeah. just about the job. It's also about the lifestyle. Um I think once I reach full professor, I might think about moving back to New Zealand, living in Wellington, working at their information school. It's right next to the National Library of New Zealand, tucked in right next to Parliament. Um, New Zealand's <laughs> doing some amazing things in terms of data sovereignty and, and ethics and those types of things. So I reckon I could have a lot of fun there. Um, those are the universities. I don't know at the moment whether I'd go into any of the tech companies. I would have said Google once upon a time, but they just sacked all their digital ethicists a couple of years ago. So I'm now kind of going. It's not paid well. <laughs> maybe, maybe not that. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, if, if the right thing came along, I would certainly consider it because, yeah, one thing my twisted little path has taught me is never close the door to an opportunity. Yeah, for sure. No, I think that it's a, it's a very good note to, to end on. Every opportunity could be leading you to something good and even if it's not straight away. But thank you so much, Dana, for joining us this afternoon and thank all of you who are online. 
for joining us, not today, but also through the term on Shape Your Future. All of the Shape Your Future sessions are available on the Stella YouTube channel, and you can see all the sessions that are coming up on the Stella website. Please register, and then we know you're coming, and you can log on and ask see more scientists just like Dana. So thank you to the Victorian Challenge and Enrichment Series for supporting this, and you will also be receiving a survey link and a worksheet link to learn a little bit more about Dana's work. Uh, after the session. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.